The Mudhouse Museum is located in Avocat along the Siparia Old Road. It used to be a part of a well-known cocoa and coffee estate. The house was built in 1885 by a woman named Tetri, who purchased the land after the plantation owners decided to sell it to their workers who could have afforded it. The idea of preserving the mud house as a museum came from one of Tetri's descendants, Ram Kumir Chatur. It was a dwelling house or plantation house where the family and workers stayed together. The family would stay inside while the workers slept outside. The museum gives us insight as to how life in Trinidad was in the 19th century, post-indentureship. The mud house was made entirely out of clay. The clay mud was mixed with cow dung to bind it and then compressed to build smooth walls. Ever so often, the walls were pasted with a mud and cow dung mixture and smoothed out as a means of preserving the structure of the walls. This process is called leaping and is all done by hand. The floors of the place were treated in a similar manner. We start our tour by going through a little wooden door. Although the sun outside is excruciating, something about this mud house is very cooling. As we move to the left, the first thing we see is a coconut broom. That was used for tidying up the place. We then see a hammock made from an old cocoa sack, which was most likely used for relaxation and resting. Next to the hammock, we see the bed of the laborer, which is made of an open jute bag spread on the bare floor. This is known as pal. There are some pieces of cloth acting as a pillow by the head, which are really a change of clothes for the laborer. We also see an enamel cup and plate here, which meant that the worker would have had his meals right there. There was also a flambeau there, or as it is known in Hindi, a chirak. The next artifact we come across was the okri and musar. This tool can be found in several different sizes to grind grains and items of different textures and sizes. They were mainly used to pound and mash herbs, spices and since this was a cocoa and coffee estate i imagine that cocoa and coffee beans were also ground in these while we highlight east indian culture in this store it is also interesting to note that this tool is also used in other cultures such as spanish and indigenous cultures the next section was where the cooking took place but before any cooking could take place they needed something to fuel the fire Gathering firewood for cooking was a norm in the 19th century, and so here we see a basket which was used to collect the firewood. To match the aesthetics of the mud house, the stoves were also made of mud. These are called chulhas and were leaped on a regular basis as well. The firewood would be placed to the bottom and the pot would rest on top of the mounds of mud. To raise the heat, simply add more firewood and to lower it, simply remove some of the firewood using another tool called the chimta, which were a pair of tongs used to hold the firewood. Since most of the cooking would be done close to the ground, it would make sense to have a little bench or pirha used to sit on while cooking. We also see a variety of utensils used for cooking and serving. They were generally referred to as bhartan. Trivia what is the Hindi word for the utensil shown? We then move on to see the various uses of coconut. The coconut is a very versatile fruit and all parts of the coconut and coconut tree can be used. The stems of the leaves are stripped to make brooms as we saw in the first picture. The leaves can be woven into mats hats and baskets. The husk or coconut fiber was commonly used to make cushions and mattresses. It was also used for gardening as cocoa peat and as a brush for washing dishes. The shell of the coconut can be used to make bowls. The most common use of coconuts during that time was the making of coconut oil. Coconuts were grated on a grater made of a sheet of metal obtained from cricks tins that was bent. 
Holes were then made into the metal, creating a sharp surface for grating. Coconuts were abundant at the time. Today, we read about the many health benefits of consuming coconut oil. And when we go to the grocery, we see exactly how expensive it is. Another tool used for grinding was the jata. The jata was commonly used for grinding grains such as rice or dal. Speaking of grinding dal, do you know how our favorite wrap roti came to be? Here is the story of dalpuri. Long ago, when East Indian laborers received rations, they needed to ensure that their rations lasted until they could get more. On one particular day, a lady named Homraji ended up with only flour and dal remaining. She boiled the dal in turmeric and then ground it in the jata along with seasonings that were easily found in the area. She made a dough with the flour and filled it with the ground dal. Homraji then rolled out the dough with her rolling pin and cooked it with some oil. Later that evening, her husband came home and prepared himself to eat dinner. When he saw her creation, he began to beat her with his belt. Her children ran to help her and asked their father why he beat her. He said that he thought she was a witch because he could not understand how she got the dal into the roti without making a hole. After explaining the process to her husband, he sat quietly and continued with his dinner. Interesting story, isn't it? In the next section, we move on to in the Mud House Museum, we see the gardening tools that were commonly used by the workers on the Coco Estate. We see gardening hoes, pitchforks, and shovels, among other tools. Next to that, we see two ceramic containers called galias that would have been used to store clarified butter or ghee and cream. In the next corner, we saw the washing area where the ladies would put a small metal tub and a wooden washing board inside it to scrub clothes. They did not have washing machines back then, so it all needed to be hand washed. The East Indian indentured laborers at the time wore simple clothes made of cotton. They had limited clothes, so the clothes needed to be washed every day. The men wore dhotis and kurtas, while the women wore ghangras, or skirts, and cholis, tops, and dupattas, or scarves. To mend or sew, there was also a singer sewing machine available. As we moved on, we saw a model of a Naparima boy's school uniform. This was the school that Ram Kumer went to. As you can see, it was not exactly a John Sport backpack that he donned. The tote bag that was used was sewn from the linen of flower bags. They also used this material to make bed sheets. After attending school, homework and revision would be done by the table shown here. Here are some of the books that were used at the time. And if you did not finish your homework and revision by that time, it got dark. You have no fear. Kerosene lamps were used to illuminate the place and provided light to study. This was a Hindu home and so a special area was set aside for religious activities. The seating for the priest and worshippers were arranged according to Hindu rules and paraphernalia used for conducting Hindu prayer ceremonies were also on display. Various pictures of Hindu deities were hung on the wall and would be worshipped every day. Indian music was something that was also brought down by our East Indian ancestors and have a great influence on local music today. One instrument that they brought down was the harmonium. The harmonium was actually invented in Europe to be a more compact version of the pipe organ but was adopted by the East Indians because of its portability and the lack of need to tune it. Another instrument that was brought down was the dholak. This is a hand drum with two sides that is mostly used to accompany folk songs. The last set of items we see in the corridor is an assortment of bottles. But these bottles were used to make flambeau for use in the nighttime or in the dark. The bottles would be filled with pitch oil and then an old piece of cloth would be torn into strips. 
one end of the cloth would go down inside to touch the bottom of the bottle and the rest would be used to stuff up the mouth of the bottle. Once the entirety of the cloth is drenched in the pitch oil, it could be lit and used as a lamp or flambeau. Before workers came to use pitch oil, it was more common for them to use coconut oil. But that's not the end of the tour. Aren't you curious to know what's behind the door? Let's find out. The inside of the mud house was more intimate and cozier. This was where the family would sleep after work and school. There were two bedrooms in this house, each of which had a bed. Under the first bed were some enamel items called the night nurse. This was used during the night time should in case someone needed to urinate during the night and did not want to go outside. Did you notice that there were no washroom area in this house? There were cavities in the walls of the house called takas, which were used to store items such as jewelry and even money. There was also a wicker basket that would have been used to store clean clothes. Laid out neatly on the beds, we also saw some common articles of women's clothing. In the next bedroom, there were men's clothing on the bed and on the floor we saw some suitcases. Long ago, they were called grips. The blinds separating the two bedrooms display a wealth of information about the family that occupied the house and gives a detailed history. It's definitely worth a read. As we conclude our tour, let's reflect on some of the things we saw here. One main theme that recurred throughout the tour was the repurposing of items. Crick's biscuit pans to make graters and to store items, old glass bottles to make flambeau, old cocoa sacks to make bedspreads, and hammocks, and several other such examples. Mrs. Rajwanti Bullock, one of the museum's caretakers, indicated that this was what it was all about, building a life out of nothing. Here at the Mudhouse Museum, you can also arrange to participate in activities such as chulha making, and you can even learn more about how cocoa was made on the estate. Currently, the Mudhouse Museum is owned and run solely by the Ram Kumer Chatur Memorial Trust. They have no assistance from the government, yet they strive to keep the legacy alive. Their hope is to become self-funding, but as it is, things have become difficult. They require volunteers and sponsors to assist in the upkeep of the premises, such as building fences. I hope you enjoyed this tour through the Mudhouse Museum. Again, this tour was just a little taste of what it really is. However, if you want the real experience, feel free to contact 7760753 or email mudhousemuseum at yahoo.com. Until next time, take care.